Okay. So what's our agenda? So we'll have an introduction and talk about what is blockchain. And then this is kind of really the key is what makes blockchain special, right? There are a lot of technologies. We're all technologists. Um, there are a lot of different programming languages that we've used or experienced in life. And we'll talk about why, why this is different. And one of those concepts is the concept of a shared ledger. And then we're going to get into really how blockchain works more from a hands-on perspective so you have a low-level detailed understanding. Some of the key concepts are consensus and using cryptography to link blocks of information together. Again, I talked, this was a security conference, so we're going to talk about security on the blockchain, wallets and transactions. Then I have some hands-on walkthroughs. There's some screenshots in the presentation, but depending on how things are flowing, I might be able to log in to uh, some of the active production blockchains. We can see what data actually looks on the blockchain. If we have enough time, we can actually save a record to the blockchain and see how that works. Talk a little bit about smart contracts, and then again, some red flags or takeaways. This was for ISACA members, but they really do apply to all of us as technologists as we explore and consider blockchain, either at least plan or elsewhere. So, so what is blockchain? So blockchain is a new technology that enables the secure transfer of value and information globally in a way that eliminates intermediaries. Okay? And we'll talk about how it does that. Again, it does that using cryptography and a shared ledger. This is the start of blockchain, so it's a relatively young or new technology. On January 3rd, 2009, a pseudonym, Satoshi Nakamoto, launched the Bitcoin network with the Genesis block. So that is the very first block in the Bitcoin network. And Satoshi really gave us a clue about as to what this was about. And this was really about financial instability and bank bailouts and creating a global currency that no one person, no one government, no one entity has control over. So there's a term for this. You could consider Satoshi the ultimate crypto anarchist. Okay? And when I first became interested in crypto, you know, blockchain and Bitcoin and those things, I really went right first to the technology. How does it work? You know, let me get under the hood and stuff. But the more time I have spent researching it and understanding it, this is, this is not about the technology. This is about social change. Blockchain will be the engine that enables social and economic change by disintermediating financial institutions and governments. That is the underlying fundamental power of what these guys launched on January 3rd, 2009, okay? And we'll talk about how this technology enables that, enables that to, to happen as we go through some of the additional slides. So with the Genesis block came, it, it, what the Genesis block did was solve a subset of problems in a unique way that was not previously possible. And we're going to talk, continue to talk about this. It created the ability for individuals to transact peer-to-peer -peer globally without knowing each other in a trusted way, eliminating the intermediaries. So, it, so it, that, I mean, you can see the potential for that to impact global financial systems. It enabled money as an internet protocol, a content type. So money is no, no longer needs to be represented by a physical piece of paper or a, a physical thing. In the blockchain and crypto space, they call it fiat. So any like euros and dollars, you'll hear those references as, as fiat currencies. So this took what is essentially a physical thing and literally turned it into a computer programming protocol. These guys launched this network with coins that had no value whatsoever that are now worth about $6,200 a piece. They were up to $20,000 in January. It's, there's been some ups and downs. 
Um, but that is the key. It's, and we're going to talk about it here in a second ago. Enabling Web 3.0. I hit on this. Very strong social overtones. There are every, not everyone, but the majority of the people that I have been involved with, particularly on the crypto side, I would categorize as millennials or higher age, you know, maybe on the higher tipping scale between X and, and millennial. Uh, this is a young group. They see the world differently. They, you know, we call them dig digital natives. I'm just sharing a, a different point of view, growing up with different tools and having dis different expectations for how they should be able to transact. Uh, so they're driving this. You'll see lots of uh, startups and what are called ICOs, initial coin offerings. You go look at any of those, and if there's anybody older than 30 on the About Us page, it, it's because the other guy's paying the bill. Cryptocurrency is fuel for decentralization, creating Web 3.0 and the Internet of Value. I know I talked about that a little bit. These two are linked very closely. The Web 3.0 is a key. That's one of the design elements that you might consider would have been nice to have in the initial internet is a way to transfer value, again, peer to peer. If you created content, for instance, let's say you created a news article rather than selling out to the New York Times and then having them publish that and get advertisers to pay for that, you publish your article and you charge you know, 50 cents to read it, except you don't need to use credit cards and go through all the other intermediaries. Someone sends you crypto and away you go, right? So direct financial system transfer over the web. Just true distributed. So we'll look at another slide in the as we go through the future slides here. And I, from an IT perspective, we're all used to the centralized systems, right? The big mainframe and the data center, uh, mid-range systems. Then we've made transitions where there are decentralized systems where you may take, the, like we're doing with SAP, right? Where we're going to have a European instance, uh, an Australian instance, and a US instance, right? That's decentralized. Blockchain is what's called distributed technology. So it runs on thousands of computers throughout the globe, connected by a protocol, but not managed in any other way other than the individual participants are participating in the network by bringing their processing power. And that is also one of the significant powers of the technology. So in the beginning, we talked about, about this slide right here, which was the launch of Bitcoin by Satoshi. And he posted in the Genesis block this headline from the Times on January 3rd, 2009, Chancellor on the Brink of Second Bailout of Banks. So their original implementation, the launch of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and then subsequently blockchain, is all based on taking financial security and decentralized, uh, dis creating a distributed currency that people have control over, not financial systems and governments. And then we talked a little bit about the age group that are the most active participants in this space and that they're a younger age group and they're looking at things differently. And so I see, and when I go to these meetings, there are the hardcore crypto anarchists, there's the folks are, how can we do something you know, in business with this, and there's kind of a range. So some of the key attributes, and I'm talking specifically here about public blockchain. It is open. As I said, it's a completely distributed system. Anybody can participate in the network. It's available for anyone to contribute to and use. These are open source products. If you don't want to use the already running public blockchain, Bitcoin or Ethereum or uh, some of these others, you can go download the source code and modify it and launch your own. Um, and a lot, so, so it's open, available to everyone. I already, I call it decentralized, it's really distributed, but it runs on thousands of computers across the globe. Uh, Ethereum's running on, I think, 16,000 machines right now, spread out across the globe. Uh, Bitcoin's a little more centralized. Most of the people who are providing capacity Bitcoin, there's a lot in China, um, and it's not as spread out. But anyway, it's neutral. There is no central authority. It's borderless. I can, I can literally take however much crypto I have in my, and associated with my account or address. That could be $10,000, could be $100,000, could be $100 million. 
And I could send that within five minutes anywhere in the world. Right now, you can't go into the bank with $9,000 to deposit without them questioning you, where does $9,000 come from? Well, I sold my car. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, 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 that's the way you feel, unfortunately. Um, since there's no central authority, it's censorship resistant, which can be a good or bad thing, right? We'll see how that plays out over the years. You can literally post any content you want to one of these blockchains right now, and there's really nothing anybody can do about it. And there's really not a great way to find out who did it. Immutable. So I would highlight this as one of the most unique differentiators. So what immutable means, or immutability, means unchangeable. Once you post a transaction on a blockchain, it is unchangeable. It is better than cast in stone. As long as there's a node on the network running, it's, it, it will not be changed. It's, it's, it's almost not possible, almost, almost not possible. Everything's <laughs> possible. So immutability is one of the keys, though, that you can't go backwards. You can't say, hey, I, I, I sent uh, 100 Bitcoin to Brad, and I sent the same 100 Bitcoin to Jonah. Only one of you are going to get the Bitcoin, and once you get it, no one's going to be able to change it. And if you save content or data to the blockchain, uh, it cannot be changed. We'll see that in a minute. Transparent, again, it's because it's open, it's also transparent. Anyone can go and see every record. Yes, Kevin. Yes. There's actually, the financial industry is one of the most likely areas where blockchain can play a significant role. And when you talk about fraud, the challenge is just like any system we develop, there is still a garbage in, garbage out component to blockchain. So there is still a requirement to verify who is making the transaction is authorized to do that. But once the transaction's in the network, it's almost impossible to corrupt. And so I think that's where it has a significant difference. When you look at some of the fraud that has occurred in the financial systems, particularly, I can't remember the name of their um, interbank sharing uh, system that's been hacked a few times. Uh, those types of hacks are almost impossible. Transparent, so we can, if we get this far in the presentation, we'll be able to go look and browse a blockchain and any one of us can do it at any time and look at any transaction and look at any data that's on there unless someone's chosen to encrypt it. Very secure, there are multiple copies of an unchangeable cryptographically secure ledger. So all of those 16,000 machines I mentioned a minute ago, all have exactly the same copy of exactly the same file on their machine. Anonymous, um, who was it, where's George? George asked me the other day about you know, the anon an anim anonymity and how that can um, be attractive for fraudulent activity, not fraud, but for corrupt purposes, right? I, I can sell heroin over the internet because you're gonna send me the Bitcoin to an address that no one's able to associate with me personally. Um, but it, isn't, it is anonymous, unstoppable. Again, all these machines are running. I hit accessible a couple of times. Quick and relatively inexpensive. So again, that large transaction I talked about, I can either send $100 or $100 million anywhere in the world for about $5 on the Bitcoin network. You can do that for probably 50 cents on the Ethereum network. And Bitcoin's 10 minutes, Ethereum's about 15 seconds. And then one of the other key items, I'm sorry, is it uses these, all use incentivization to incentivize all of the participants to reap greater rewards by being a good actor than being, by being a bad actor, right? So there are more incentives to you to uh, provide mining equipment and be a good, honest, reliable miner than there are for you to undermine the system to try to hack it. So in the United States, if you look at it, we're really on an honor system anyway. And that applies to this as well, right? So if you're in business today and you accept cash payments from someone for a goods or services, you have the responsibility of recording that and paying taxes on it. The same applies here. There are exchanges that are being developed in the US and in all these other countries. There's actually thousands of exchanges. Um, so there is a whole 
another discussion about regulation, regulation particularly in the cryptocurrency space, and how to, how to do that. Um, but not all the regulations are in place yet. They're, you're not going to get a, um, whatever you call it, 1099 or whatever the form is you get from your uh, TD Ameritrade or whatever. You're not going to get that from your crypto exchange. But tax law, you do have a responsibility of reporting those gains if you make money in the crypto space. So let's talk about some of the compelling use cases. So currency is the obvious one and how that plays in financial systems and being able to transfer money. Uh, supply chain, there's a lot of energy around supply chain. Um, and food tracking, you guys have probably either seen or heard these. IBM has a commercial about you know, turning an apple into applesauce and how it can get tracked all the way. Uh, same kind of thing that I'll mention earlier. Garbage in, garbage out, right? So you do, in those cases, have to have certification of the IoT network that's being used to publish those timestamps and fingerprints to the blockchains, right? So if you can't keep that piece from being corrupt, then the purpose of the blockchain is going to be defeated a little bit. There's a lot of discussion about digital identity and the ability to, when you're born, say this is this person and this is when they were born and again, having that accessible, talking about how to transition that or translate that into either financial systems or uh, health and welfare and whatnot. So there's a concept of personas where on the blockchain you could have different personas that allow you to share different pieces of your identity for different purposes. Um, again, so you could say, I can share my credit score to this financial institution, but I'm not going to share with them the fact that I was just at the doctor a week ago having an EKG. I wasn't, by the way. Asset tokenization, this is another huge one. And again, this is about financial. And then crowdfunding, uh, also huge. So there are literally thousands of what are called ICOs that have been launched, initial token offering. And a lot of them look very much like an initial stock offering where a group of folks will get together and say, hey, we have this great idea. Uh, Telegram is one of them that's a, a new messaging platform. So Telegram actually did an ICO for their crowdfunding. So they, they issued a coin. They got all kinds of investors to invest in the coin. And now they've launched this uh, secure messaging platform. Fancy Excel spreadsheet or database with these two unique characteristics. As I mentioned, it's distributed. So it's shared between multiple parties. Each party has an identical copy or version of the ledger. Whenever a new transaction is committed, each participant on the network's nodes are updated. The second characteristic is that the ledger is cryptographically immutable. So if I want to post a transaction to the ledger, the network participants must agree that that transaction is true or authentic. This is done using a consensus mechanism that the participants agree to use to verify the authenticity and the validity of a transaction. Because once the transaction is committed to the ledger, it's signed and hashed and cannot be changed later. So far, there's no such thing as the network being down. Again, because it's completely distributed. So there are thousands of nodes. So if a node goes offline, it's just no longer participating in the network. But transactions do queue. There is a queuing mechanism uh, before transactions are valid validated and posted to the ledger. So, so, so there's a queuing mechanism, but there has not been an instance of, quote, the network being down. So there is a process of, of rebuilding your copy of the ledger, and you have to do that before you can participate again in the network. So those are called, there's, there are different types of nodes in the network. There are called full nodes, and there are miners. So full nodes are the ones that have the copies of the ledger. And uh, it is, they're very uh, network intensive. So I ran a full node in my house for a while, but then the kids couldn't video game and it was hard to browse the web. So, so I, I have one that is a full node on the cloud, but then I also have uh, several miners, which is part of where I got interested in this. The question was, is the objective to replace all currency globally so that my uh, Bitcoin, for instance, is, has the same value in Argentina as it has in the United States as it has in Europe. I would say that the crypto anarchists would answer that with a resounding yes. Uh, I would say that the uh, more realistic folks involved in the financial industry today would say that's probably not the likely end game, that there's some combination between uh, regulated currency 
and fiat currency and uh, use of Bitcoin and other types of currencies. So is that what those guys wanted to do? Yes. Is it, I, I'm in the, a little bit as more skeptical that it, that's achievable. What's interesting here is that decentralization and having a distributed platform is resulting in di distributed decision-making systems as well, right? So all these other things are now becoming part of decentralization. So information is becoming distributed, knowledge is becoming distributed, reputation, um, responsibility, votes, consensus, decision rights, identity. We're going to talk about it later slide, but there is a whole concept of a distributed autonomous organization that is something that can be programmed using what are called smart contracts and those enable decisions to be made as programmed without intervention. So I'm going to transition now to talk a little bit more about the technology and what it is about the technology itself that enables the differentiators that I showed on the earlier screens, okay? One of the key differentiators is the use of cryptography, both a thing called a hash and a thing called actually encrypting. And we're going to talk about the differences. In this case, we're going to talk about a hash. Hash is used all over the place in uh, blockchain and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. It is used for the addresses, transaction IDs, and for transaction and block signatures. It's a fingerprint of data as it was input into the hashing function. The output is always the same length. So you could put in high Andy, and it's going to be 26 characters long, or however the length is that is output from the hashing algorithm you're using. You could copy and paste the Library Congress in the text field and it's going to be a 26 character output. So it creates a signature. It is one way. So I can hash something. I can send it anywhere in the world to anyone. There is no way for them to take that hash and turn it into the original data. So hashing is used really for signature and fingerprinting. So the way that helps is I can take a PDF, for example. I can put it into a hashing function. I can get the hash out. I can send you the hash. I can send you the PDF. And you can confirm by putting the PDF through the hashing function that the PDF has not been altered, or a Word document, or a title, or a health test, test exam, or a picture, or, 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 or. So, Again, the power of the ability to do this. Um, there's one called SHA-256, which is a very common hashing function. That creates 10 to the 77 power possible combinations. So there is a chance that I could put in high Andy and you could put in high Brad, and it could come to the same hashing function. But the probability is so low that it's considered almost impossible. Encryption, your data is actually scrambled. And you can actually get your data back by having the passcode or the private key that was used in order to encrypt the data. So again, I can take HiAndy. I can put it into an encryption algorithm. It's going to come out gobbledygook. I can send you the gobbledygook. I can send you the key, in this case, a public key. Or no, private key. You have to have the private key. Um, and then I can read it. Right, so I had that. I described that backwards. I apologize. So in, in private, in PKI, there's a private key and a public key. I can give you the public key. You can encrypt Hi Andy. You can send that to me, but I'm the only in the one in the world who can read it because I have the only key that opens the box. So you can put it in the box, close it, lock it with your key, send it to me. I'm the only one that can ever open that box. So reaching consensus. So he talked about that. A minute ago in his video, there are a few different ways to reach consensus, i.e. to agree that a transaction is valid and should be put on the blockchain. So these are the most common ones. This is proof of work is the consensus mechanism that is being used by the two main coins on the market, two main blockchains, that's um, Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
Now there are hundreds and thousands of others. A lot of them are trying to migrate to this proof of stake, but there's a lot of questions about really how secure proof of stake is. When you hear about Bitcoin, you talk about all the electricity that's being used. All that electricity is being used to do this thing called proof of work. Proof of work is the most um, prevalent consensus mechanism. It is from a miner's perspective, and again, a miner is the, the computers that try to solve these problems. So there are thousands of mining machines in the network. They're the ones who are really providing the horsepower for the network. It is literally a math game. So what you do, and I'll show this in a future slide, is you take the data that is to be hashed, and you have to find a number. So you take that data, you hash it, and then you have to find a number that if you add this number to the, to the data, it will result in a hash with a certain number of zeros at the front of it. And the number of zeros that need to be at the front of it become greater and greater depending on how they want to manage the difficulty of the network. So right now, it takes 10 minutes to write a block of data to the Bitcoin network, and that is intentional because that's the security mechanism. And solving that number that I talked about, that additional number you need to add is called a nonce. And what this allows is I, I can find the answer. In other words, my computer might be the one that says, okay, I have this data, I've added the number 7,218 to that data, and now I have a hash that has four zeros in front of it. I've solved the problem. Now what I do when, we talked, when he talked about everybody else has to agree, what I then do is I publish that back to the network and I say, I found the answer. And then anyone else can take the data and that number and get the same hash that I got, and they'll go, yeah, that's the right answer. And that's the security mechanism that ensures that only valid blocks are written to the blockchain. It's hard to, hard to get the answer, but very easy to validate it. Difficulty is a measure of how hard the problem is to solve. I think, block, I think Bitcoin right now is 20 zeros. So it takes tons and tons and tons of processing power across thousands and thousands of machines to literally randomly guess what the nonce is. And so there are this thing called mining pools. And what happens is the mining pool operator runs a full node. The request to publish a transaction comes to the full node. The full node then takes and sends that to all of its miners. So let's say I've got 1,000 miners. He'll say, you have between 0 and 100. You have between 101 and 200. You have between 201 and 300, right? So he distributes all the work. And he goes grinding through 0 to 100 as fast as he can to see if he gets the right nonce. And if he doesn't, but JV does, JV sends it back to the network, and all three of you get a piece of the reward. Okay? So that's where mining pools come from, and that's, the hor that's where the horsepower of the network is. So as a miner, you get compensated for two things. So each time a block is solved, there's a thing called a Coinbase transaction that is made. That's where money is magically created out of software space. And that is rewarded to the person who solved the problem or the mining pool. And in Bitcoin right now, the reward for solving a block is 12.5 Bitcoin. At the time of writing this, that was $85,000. Okay? So if you solve it yourself, you get to keep it all. The odds of you solving it yourself are pretty low. That's why they've started these pools. The other thing that you get is um, our transaction fees. So each transaction on the Bitcoin network also has a weight, and depending on the size of the transaction that has associated fee with it, if you submit your transaction to the network and you don't associate enough value to it, the miners will just ignore it, right? So you, you can have transactions sit in, in the mempool, the memory pool forever, and not get processed. You can go back and resubmit them and hope somebody picks it up, but there's kind of a sweet spot of how much, um, uh, how much you know, is the right amount. And there are calculators that you, can, that you can use to do that. This is a great example of how blockchain actually works. So this is the first block on the left is block one. I'm going to type some stuff in here. So assume this is transaction one, transaction two, transaction three, send 
5 Bitcoin from JV to Jonah, send 10 bit Bitcoin from Andy to Lori, okay? That's what I just typed in here. Use your imagination. You'll see that all the boxes turn red. As soon as I made a change, it said this data no longer matches the hash that it's supposed to match, okay? So I'm going to mine this block now. So the, this program is going to go look and find the number and watch the nonce change. It's 11316 right now. That nonce is going to change to a number that allows that data to be matched with this new number. So this data plus 93816 equals 000, zero, zero blah, 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 hash, OK? Now, the reason you can use a number, I won't get too far into this, but the reason you can use a number is because this hash actually is just a huge number. So if you take this and you start splitting it out and you go, uh, and hex, a C is whatever position, so that's 13 or 12, whatever C is. And then you add to that a zero plus whatever a two is, and you keep building it all the way out. This is that 70, 10 to the 77 power number by the time you get all the way to the end. So the reason it's difficult is what it's actually looking for is it's telling you you need to find a small number that matches the hash. Um, I hope that wasn't too much. So now you can see the rest of the blocks are red though, right? The way the blocks are linked together is the hash of the previous block becomes part of the content that is hashed in the next block. So they are cryptographically linked in a way that it is impossible to change this block and still match this block without remining all of the blocks subsequent to the block that you changed and doing that more quickly than the rest of the network is mining the blocks that it's mining in a legitimate way. That's why it's basically impossible to change. The amount of processing power it would take to change block number one, so here's transaction number two, transaction number four, five, six, or this, this could be data, right? I'm saying transactions. It could be, uh, this is Andy Knable's certification for passing ISACA that I just put into this data field. And now I have to mine this block. And you're going to watch, you're going to see that this right now, this is going to equal that. And then we're going to have a new hash. And that's going to keep this block from being valid until it is remined. So look at the number. So the number right now is 35230. That's why it takes a second, right? This, this is proof of work. Some computer out there right now is solving this math problem. It just did. So we have our four zeros that we required. So that's the level of difficulty we're looking for in this example. Remember, Bitcoin's like 20. Um, now you'll see that this previous, I'm sorry, I should have been pointing at this. But now you'll see that the previous hash matches this, right? So it's something, something, 2C. Those blocks are linked together. There's nothing that anybody can do to change that. That's, that's the immutability. This block has now been distributed to 16,000 nodes across the globe on each of those independent ledgers. That is practically impossible to change. You're going to go find 16 nodes. I, I got three of them in my basement, right? I mean, they're like that everywhere across the world. So it depends. So getting into the blockchain for business perspective, you have an opportunity to either use a public network that already exists, and you can end up doing nothing more than paying by the transaction, or you can launch your own what are called private or permissioned blockchain. Uh, IBM's Hyperledger is one of the large comp competitors in the private blockchain space. Ethereum, which I mentioned a couple times, you can go out to Microsoft and Azure and you can pick a drop down that says run your own uh, Ethereum blockchain and you can launch your own private permissioned blockchain. Um, so in those scenarios, you don't need all this extra computing power. You don't need all the reward systems, but you're giving up security for that, right? The fewer nodes that are in the network, the fewer participants there are, the easier it is to create fraud in a business network, theoretically, you're working with trusted partners, and that's not as much of an issue. So there are a couple different parts of that. So again, there are full nodes. I've got a full node 
but I'm using that to start to experiment with development. Uh, we didn't get into smart contracts, so there is a development language called smart contracts in Ethereum. It's a, quote, Turing complete language, which just means it's a full-bodied uh, programming language. You can actually write programs that are stored on and run from the blockchain. Um, and so in order to do that, you either need to be calling APIs from someone who's providing full node services, and there are some of those out there, uh, or you need to run your own node. The other half of it are the mining uh, machines, and I have several of those as well. They're not running right now, so the price of Ethereum has dropped to a point where it's no longer, uh, I'm, pat I'm below the break-even point for electricity, so I turned them off. But I did run them all winter. It spread out throughout my house, and I didn't run my heater all winter. So, so, I, got, so I got paid for heat in the house. <laughs> I got paid for heat and that was, it was fun, it was fun. So again, the hope was to you know, treat this as an introduction. Um, the foundation is in cryptocurrency, but where we're, where we're looking at from a business perspective really has to do what are the applications of this new technology for business. I mentioned the couple, or the one thing that uh, Leafs Plan's already doing. Voting is a huge example. Um, I would not be surprised to see uh, blockchain-based voting as um, something that becomes mainstream maybe 10 years from now, but it's, it's ideal for voting. It's absolutely ideal for voting where, where I can have my address that no one else knows, and I can go into the voting booth, the virtual voting booth, I can cast my vote, I can then go confirm that my vote was cast for the candidate or for the decision I wanted it to be cast for. I can see everyone else's votes that were cast. Um, so there will be complete instant transparency in voting. Again, it's the garbage in, garbage out. You've got to verify that I am the person who should have that private key and be able to cast that vote. All right, thanks, everybody, for participating. I appreciate it. Thanks.